Ellisville Marsh in South Plymouth is recognized as one of the most ecologically valuable and sensitive coastlines in our state. This saltwater marsh and estuary are home to a wide range of wildlife and habitats, maintained for hundreds of years by farming and fishing communities. Storm damage, erosion, and channel blockage since the 1980s has deteriorated this precious landscape. And we went on the local scene to talk with Eric Cody, author of Rescuing Ellisville Marsh, The Long Fight to Restore Lost Connections. Close your eyes. Imagine that you're in a place about the size of Plymouth Center that has 240 species of birds, 150 species of plants, and if you're lucky, you can look offshore occasionally and see gray seals and harbor seals lounging on the rocks at low tide. And imagine that first people came to this place 13,000 years ago, not only before the pilgrims, but 8,000 years before the pyramids were built in Egypt, and that successive generations farmed and fished and gathered here uh, and imagine that this place is connected to the sea by a, a narrow stream through which 200 million gallons of water flow every day. So it's not hard to imagine that this place would be recognized as special, uniquely valuable natural resource. We're standing at Ellisville Marsh, a 70-acre salt marsh. It's really the only salt marsh resource in the town of Plymouth uh, between the Cape Cod Canal and Duxbury. And it's a very special place. There are 250 species of birds that have been found here, 150 plant species, and its history goes back 13,000 years, believe it or not. Salt marshes in general are some of the most prized natural resources on Earth. I think most people are unaware that a salt marsh actually is 10 times more efficient than a tropical forest in removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It's also three times more efficient in storing carbon dioxide in the biomass, the soils, than a tropical rainforest. So we've got something here that is a weapon against global warming to begin with. It's also a buffer against sea level rise. But even if we weren't experiencing these existential threats from climate change, this place is an incubator for a huge range of marine and terrestrial species. And if you look in the distance, across the marsh out there, you'll see the tidal inlet that connects Ellisville Marsh with Cape Cod Bay. That's a very important feature. 200 million gallons of water a day flow through that narrow inlet at a rate of uh, 2,000 gallons per second. It's very important to keep that inlet open for the ecosystem in the marsh to stay healthy. One of our neighbors became involved in 2002 and three because the tidal inlet had been blocked and migrated southward 1,500 feet to the point where it had been eroding the coastal bank under his house. If he hadn't addressed it, um, his house could have potentially fallen over the 40-foot bank onto the beach within a decade. So he got a one-time emergency permit and reopened it in 2003. Unfortunately, there was further work a couple of years later and the Mass DEP brought an enforcement action against my neighbor. Out of that enforcement, there was a, a consent order at the end of the whole process, which required that a nonprofit, uh, which we call the Friends of Ellisville Marsh, be formed to take on the responsibility and the burden of acquiring all the necessary permits to maintain the tidal inlet and doing the work. The purpose was at least for the first year or two, was partly to save houses on the coastal bank. That problem was quickly addressed and the mission shifted to fisheries and wildlife. So that for the past 13 years at least, the organization has been focused on the health of this system that uh, you see behind me. And we hope that viewers will consider joining us. We're always looking for new members and volunteers. About 10 years ago now, I was doing a talk on the the project, Revitalization Project and the Friends at the Pine Hills. As we were discussing the regulatory challenges that we faced, which, which were excruciating at the time, there was a gentleman in the crowd who said, boy, this is fascinating, you should write a book about this. And I just kind of put the idea in my back pocket. And then COVID came along in 2020, and we were, some of us were twiddling our thumbs, wondering what we would do with our, 
our new spare time, and I wrote a sample chapter and, and an outline. And so I thought, oh, this is the chapter was on piping plovers, which yeah. is my first love among all the work we do here. I explored shopping it around to some publishers, and lo and behold, that year I got an advance contract from University of Massachusetts Press. They have an imprint called Brightleaf that's not scholarly, it's, uh, but it's intended to raise awareness and inspire others in areas like the environment. Uh, so I got this advanced contract, and when that happens, if you're like me and never experienced this, you take it seriously. And uh, over the next six months or so, I wrote the rest of the book, the manuscript. At the end of 2021, they made the final approval to, to publish it. If I was writing a chapter, say, on invasive plants, I found myself walking around forming ideas in my head. I would sort of write a, a mental paragraph and then I'd stop somewhere and, and write it on a piece of paper in my pocket. It was fairly straightforward just because the experience was so vivid. If anyone who reads the book comes away inspired or compelled to do something, no matter how modest, then it will have succeeded. And I hope also that it'll maybe be a, a stake in the ground about maybe some regulatory reforms in environmental agencies in Massachusetts and federally. Natural resources define Plymouth. If we want to protect and enhance Plymouth, we need to protect and enhance our natural resources. We have 450 ponds and 36 miles of coastline. Water is a key issue here. And, uh, you know, sometimes people are, including town leaders, are pretty complacent about this. So I'm hoping that it'll raise awareness um, of uh, what needs to be done. The only other experience I've had like this goes back to seventh grade. I had a great teacher who took the whole class out after lunch during a study period one day, he took us out behind the school, into the woods, told us to stop, be quiet, and close our eyes. He said, listen and smell the air and don't say anything for the next five minutes. And I will never forget that exercise in mindfulness that he led us on all those years ago. And this is that kind of thing on steroids. We have so much to look at and look for that it's an unrivaled experience. You can learn more about Ellisville Marsh at ellisvillemarsh.org and about Eric's book through umasspress.com. Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.